Before we begin the formal program, allow me to thank my colleagues, including Samira Bazorgi, Ray Pun, Marianne Villaver, Mike Wang, and many others at the Hoover Institution for their help in making this event possible. Thank you also to the Stanford Historical Society for co-sponsoring this excellent talk. And thank you, of course, to the community of overseers of the Hoover Institution and other supporters without whose generous support, nothing we do would be possible. Today's talk is titled From Past to Present, an online discussion reflecting on the impact of the Hoover Tower upon its 80th anniversary. And fittingly, it takes place literally 80 years to the day on which the Hoover Tower was dedicated, June 20th, 1941. 1941 was also the year in which Stanford's 50th anniversary was celebrated all year long. Those of you who know the Hoover Institution today would find it fitting that the tower dedication was preceded by a multi-day academic symposium on the university and the future of America. Then a dedication ceremony that included speeches by the president of Stanford, the president of Yale, and the former president of the United States and Stanford's most famous graduate, Herbert Hoover. In that year also, Lou Henry Hoover was named an honorary fellow of Stanford and spoke to its graduating class. Today's speakers will be in this order, Jeff Tillman, Sapna Marfatia, and myself. After our remarks, the speakers will be happy to answer questions, which I will moderate. Please use the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen to ask questions. Now allow me to introduce our speakers. Jeffrey Tillman is an associate professor at the University of Cincinnati. He researches and writes on the history of American architecture between the Civil War and World War II, focusing on the first decades of the 20th century. A registered architect, Tillman's interest in historic preservation stems from a conviction that preservation is a part of architectural practice and no work of architecture is fully successful unless it addresses its pre-existing social, political, physical, and historical context. Jeff is also the author of Arthur Brown Jr. Progressive Classicist. Sapna Marfatya's professional experience spans architecture, planning, urban design, historic preservation, and teaching. She has a bachelor's in architecture, a master's in urban design, and a master's in liberal arts. For 19 years, as the Stanford University Director of Architecture, Sapna has assisted in the selection of architectural and preservation consultant teams, monitor design guidelines from formulation through construction to convey architectural concepts, and collaborated with university partners to create a vision for preservation of iconic buildings. Please welcome Jeff and Sapna. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. I'm going to speak a bit about Arthur Brown's career and particular, why a tower? And so Arthur Brown, of course, is somewhat well known in the Bay Area. He's not as well known nationally as he had been during the 1920s and 30s. But he is the architect with his firm, Bakewell and Brown, of San Francisco City Hall, uh, Coit Tower, as we'll see, the Federal Triangle, at least the uh, Department of Labor and the Interstate Commerce Commission buildings there. Uh, he's the architect of Sprawl Hall at the University of California, Berkeley, and the uh, architect of at least 25 buildings here on the Stanford campus, including the Green Library and the Hoover Tower. Brown's career spans from a very successful stint at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts uh, from 1896 to about 1903, where he was the most decorated and lauded American architect present at the Ecole, all the way to really the 1950s. Uh, the Hoover Tower is one of his later works, nearly his last work, and it's a work for which he was very proud. Next slide, please. So we'll be looking at how the Hoover Tower came into its form, what it really represents the culmination of Brown's work in the tower form. So while he's an architect known for his great domes, like Temple Emmanuel, and San Francisco City Hall and, and Pasadena City Hall. Uh, today, we'll be looking at the more vertical expressions. And it starts here really at the Stanford campus. While Brown had done a couple double houses for the trustees for faculty uh, around 1910, 1911, 
uh, his real work at Stanford, uh, at least for the academic buildings, begins with the old union, which was, uh, of course, uh, a project headed by Herbert Hoover. And here Brown is trying to find a, an appropriate Mediterranean expression for a building that was on the campus but set apart a bit from the academic buildings uh, that really were part of the inner and outer quad. Brown did know the buildings at Stanford fairly well. He was very closely associated with Timothy Hopkins, who was head of the trustees at the time. In fact, he basically grew up uh, with Timothy Hopkins as a figure in his life. And so the old union, particularly the little four-story tower, is the beginning of the idea of a tower at the Stanford campus. Now, mostly Brown worked in the Romanesque form while here at Stanford. Next slide, please. The uh, Thomas Stanford Art Gallery, for example, is a building here on Quad 3 that tries to mimic the Richardsonian Romanesque work of Bruton, Shepley, and Coolidge, the original buildings on the quads. Uh, so much so that had the building been finished completely as intended, it would have had all the sculptural embellishments of the other buildings on the quads. And it was intended to create a new third quad, quad three, if you will, uh, that would complement the central quads. Of course, World War I interrupted this process and the building was finished in a hurry and not to full completion. Brown's work in the Mediterranean revival style um, always means that there's going to be some kind of tower. At the terminal building, railroad terminal building for the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad at San Diego, the question became how many towers? No tower? One tower? Two towers? Uh, it was quite a question. He eventually chose a twin tower motif with a large open air atrium in front. And if you look at these sketches, there are two towers here, Tower A and Tower B. You'll notice the similarity of this Tower A designed around 1914 to some of the motifs that we see at the Hoover Tower, particularly the pyramidal pinnacles at the corners as the square tower moves into an octagonal kind of um, drum, if you will, for the round cupola above. The San Francisco Art Institute also featured a tower. This one much more Italianate as the entire art institute was made to appear to resemble an Italian hill town or maybe a monastery in Tuscany, something like that. It's a building that rambles down Russian Hill and the tower was meant to be kind of a beacon from which these students might view much of the Bay Area. From here, we get kind of the language of the windows that we see at the Hoover Institution. Next slide, please. So uh, the Art Institute is uh, really something of an anomaly, but it's, it's a simplified version of the Mediterranean. So we don't get a lot of sculptural embellishment that would come later as the students added to the building, particularly as Diego Rivera did his mural painting in the building. Uh, but this simplicity of form is something we're going to see that the over elaboration of the tower form gets simplified as Brown's career continues. And the other thought is that towers needed to be functional. Brown uh, was always interested in the skyscraper form. He did build the PG&E building on Market Street in San Francisco. Uh, next to the Matson building. Here he's using classical revival motifs, but ornamenting the building with elements that were supposed to be distinctly Californian. 
particularly uh, you'll see on the building uh, elk heads and bear heads and this kind of thing, the flora and fauna of California, lots of bears everywhere. The Bourne building, uh, the second drawing here from the left was a skyscraper project that was uh, really commissioned by William Bowers Bourne, uh, the uh, head of uh, the Spring Valley Water Company, the owner of the Empire Mine up in Nevada County. And here Brown is beginning to streamline the skyscraper. So we're seeing in the 1930s a movement away from some of the elaborate ornamentation of, say, the work before World War I, like San Francisco City Hall. Yet at the same time in the 20s, Brown is looking at what kind of ornamentation can be rendered in relatively new materials. At Pasadena City Hall, for example, the dome tower is almost exclusively concrete. There is a steel superstructure in the dome section itself, but all of the ornament that you see on the building in the dome tower, all of this ornamentation is placed in situ. So uh, the uh, cornices, for example, were run in concrete. And so the, the building itself demonstrates how much ornament one could do in a concrete structure. Now, this is running a bit counter to architectural trends of the day, which are trying to simplify things. And particularly, the expression of concrete as we now understand it. Next slide, please. Brown didn't believe that concrete should be left bare. There should always be a rendering over it so that you can get the kind of texture, finish, and fineness of detail that he really believed made a work of architecture. The opacity of the city hall, though, also demonstrates the big motif. Brown believed very much that a building should have some sort of overwhelming focus to it. And if a building was too small, it wouldn't really achieve the impact that it should. We can see that here with Coit Tower. Uh, the drawing on the left is the first rendering for Coit Tower. And I want to add that Coit Tower as an idea dates way before Lily Coit's bequest. That as early as 1905 in the Burnham plan for San Francisco, Brown drew an image of Telegraph Hill with a lighthouse, a pharos, at the top of it. And that really is the genesis for the idea of Coit Tower. In fact, the tower was supposed to have an ever-burning flame, a gas jet that would come up out of the top of the tower. And it's piped for it. It's never actually been lit, but uh, the potential would still be there. This little tower uh, didn't impress people too much. And one of Brown's concerns with Coit Tower was getting the building big enough that it would look appropriate from the ground, from below in the harbor. But he also was very much in keeping in mind that the tower would be seen from Russian Hill directly in elevation. That unlike most towers, this wasn't sitting on the highest prominence in the area. Telegraph Hill was actually fairly low and everything else around it a little taller. So you'll notice that the tower gets taller and taller. It also gets more streamlined. Fewer flutes around the shaft of the column. The entrance becomes more blocky. In some ways, the first building, the first rendering of the tower has more in common with the Hoover Institution than the final product. Uh, but Brown did like the taller tower. He constantly tried to find money so that uh, the tower could get larger. I will say uh, the, the taller tower really does give it some prominence. Next slide, please. So uh, the, the shorter tower impressed nobody. Gertrude Atherton in particular thought it looked stubby. Uh, and uh, we certainly wouldn't want to have disappointed her. She was the one of the dissenting votes on the Art Commission that approved the project. 
The uh, Sanctuary for Peace and Beauty that you see on the left-hand side here is uh, a project that was brought to Brown by a guy named Mario Spagna, who wanted to aggrandize the top of Mount Temple Pius in Marin County with some sort of chapel to nature. Uh, and here Brown is looking to try to streamline the tower form. Again, we get these elongated, attenuated forms that we're going to see at the Hoover Institution as well. And while that project didn't get built, at the same time, Brown was designing the theme structure for the Golden Gate International Exposition, the Tower of the Sun. This did get built, it was built on Treasure Island as part of the fairgrounds, and it uh, was up for about two, two and a half years, taken down in 1940. The Tower of the Sun was Brown's tallest tower. It also has some, something of the most Gothic flavor of Brown's work in the tower form. And again, we see that attenuation and the streamlining, the abstraction of the Gothic forms that really is a hallmark of Brown's later work. Next slide, please. The Tower of the Sun uh, was a building Brown, for which Brown was very proud. He did this rendering in the center himself, adding a lot of the detail, including the fireworks display that's implied in the dark areas of the, of the image. Now with Hoover Tower, the uh, building itself had started uh, as the university architects began to kind of think about the tower, particularly the, the librarians and the, the head archivist, they thought of it as a three-story block of a building with a reading room on the ground floor and uh, maybe about two stories of stacks, of maybe three to six layers of stacks in the center of the building. Brown looked at the program and thought, well, the, you know, the real issue with a library, and particularly this library, was that the collections were ever growing and that they really needed to plan for about two and a half times more material than the library currently held. And so he suggested the tower form. This was something that Brown wanted for Stanford. He felt that ever since the earthquake in 1906, the Stanford campus had lacked a vertical expression. The chapel itself really didn't punctuate the campus from any distance. And he thought that Stanford needed some kind of vertical element that would mark the campus on the general skyline of the peninsula and particularly from the bay in much, it must be admitted, the same way that Sather Tower marks the University of California campus at that other important school in the East Bay. And so Brown proposes this mission design. The tower itself is relatively interesting and the lower portion of the building is not that different than what gets built, but the top of the building was unsatisfactory. As a kind of simple hip roof with a reading room up at the top of the tower. Interesting idea, but the hipped roof itself didn't seem to really carry the kind of aesthetic weight that Brown was looking for. It is said that at a meeting with Herbert Hoover and Lou Henry Hoover, Brown showed them this rendering, uh, which was by Francis Todd Hunter, by the way, and Lou Henry Hoover suggested that Brown look at the cathedral at Salamanca in Spain, where there is a dome on an octagonal base with pyramidal uh, kind of uh, pilasters coming up from the pinnacles coming up from the corners. Brown apparently was immediately taken with the idea and started sketching up a form for the, this tower. The image you see on the right is a drawing that we just discovered uh, that may have been the first drawing that Brown did for this new form for the tower. We see him sketching up pilasters at the corners of an octagon with a domed tower with a lantern on top 
all of the essentials of the new look for the Hoover Institution. Next slide, please. So uh, on the back of this drawing is a plan sketch. And it looks like Brown was attempting to merge the new tower idea with elements within the plan. Brown then took this idea and put it into a model. This cardboard model, which uh, was the one model that Brown kept after his career was over. In fact, the family kept it for decades later. I myself even seen it. This was a working model. Brown kept it not in his office, but in his library, in his home in Atherton at La Verge. And he, his daughter told me he would come home at night and fiddle with the tower, adding windows, maybe changing the height a bit, little bit, changing the size of the pinnacles, worrying about the uh, thickness of the pilasters on the shaft of the tower. Uh, he just fiddled with this thing for about six months or so as the fundraising for the tower got on the way and as they were doing uh, some of the engineering drawings. This led to the really the building that got built. The rendering that we see here, which was used in part for fundraising, really shows the building very close to how it was executed. And the idea here was to have a steel frame that could hold the library stacks in the central floors of the building, offices up at the top, initially a reading room at the very top of the building, and museum and office space at the base. The building is something of a hybrid. It's a steel frame with concrete walls in the enclosure, and the lower two floors are all reinforced concrete. The walls varying from 12 inches to as little as uh, six to eight inches at the top of the tower. Uh, you'll notice, for example, here they've built a temporary ramp to allow the concrete trucks to come in over the walls of the plinth or base of the building so that they could pour the walls from the top. Next slide, please. So these construction photos are simply, uh, you know, really excellent kind of teaching tools to show how this hybrid structure was constructed. The Hoover Tower as completed sits as kind of a accomplished uh, summation of Brown's towers. And Brown felt that way. He did this sketch in 1939, showing four of his towers, uh, the tower at the Art Institute, Coit Tower, Hoover Tower, and the Tower of the Sun, along with, at the same scale, the Sather Tower at the University of California at that place across the bay and the Campanile, St. Mark's Campanile in Venice. You'll notice he's looking at the kind of general characteristics. Uh, how tall are these towers? What is the ratio from width to height? This kind of thing. Uh, and in some ways, uh, the Hoover Tower is the best proportioned and the most handsome of the bunch. It's not just sheared off at the top like Coit Tower. It's not way too skinny, uh, maybe as the Tower of the Sun was criticized in some ways. It sits as a very proper, well-proportioned monument that at this point has become the symbol and the image of Stanford University for the last 80 years. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. That was excellent. Thank you so much. Now we'll go to Sapna, please. Thank you, Eric. Good evening. Thank you for this opportunity to participate in the celebration of one of the most iconic buildings on Stanford's campus. I'm sure all of you all know, but let me point out, Hoover Tower is located directly east of the main quad. It's really a multifaceted building. Next. It is an architectural landmark that you look from in the horizon. You look at it and I don't know how many countless students must have taken their photographs before graduation in front of this iconic building. And if you take the journey up to the 14th floor, you can even look beyond the tower and look at the whole Bay Area. 
This pair of buildings, as Jeff previously mentioned, Hoover Tower, as Tower and the Thomas Welton Art Gallery represents a radical shift in architectural thinking at Stanford. By comparing and contrasting the tower with the art gallery, I will highlight some obvious differences in style, massing, material, and some other not so obvious differences in planning principles. So you've seen this before, but Bakewell and Brown, the architectural firm, was the architect of both these buildings. Bakewell and Brown contributed close to about 25 buildings to the Stanford campus. Their academic work started with the art gallery and ended with Hoover Tower. This three decade period between 1910 and 1940 was filled with adversity. As you can see, including the 1906 earthquake recovery was followed by the two world wars. Therefore, each decade here can be viewed as a progression in maturity of their work, as well as a reflection of the changing times. It is important to note the evolution here. The massing gets simplified and the material changes from stone to stucco or cement plaster. So as you can see, the art gallery was done in the uh, stone and then eventually it ended up as Jeffrey already mentioned in cement plaster. Some of the features used in the early buildings, such as the old union's dome, um, Encina Hall's octagonal gallery and Toyan Hall's towers get refined finally in the tower design. The tower's mass is essentially divided into three subparts. There's the podium at the base, the shaft, which is kind of the elongation of a square, and then finally a dome at the top. So here you can see that the, the um, the dome basically is the resolution of the geometry from a very square form at the bottom. And then it goes into this elongated shaft and then finally ends into a circular tile dome at the top uh, crowned with a lantern. And um, what you see is this, this transition from a square to a point. There is a gradual evolution of materials from um, the, the materials that we were that were used at the art gallery was pre predominantly stone. And um, then you can see that by the time we get to the cement plaster, the aesthetic changes dramatically. Uh, the composition of the tower is more solid, simple, and vertical. It reflects the shift in construction technology that Jeffrey mentioned from stone to steel and concrete construction. This is my favorite uh, slide because comparing these three entry portals, it is possible to see the remarkable change in aesthetic. Hoover Tower's entry is simple, stripped of ornamentation with much lighter vertical proportions compared to the main quad or even art gallery where you see a lot of ornamentation. Through the next few slides, I'm gonna walk us through the evolution of planning that took place over here. This is the university's original master plan at the top where the east and west quadrangles were envisioned on either side to accommodate future growth. Memorial Arch and Main Quad both were completed prior to 1906 earthquake that you can see at the bottom. Memorial Arch and Memorial Church were the original interrupters of Stanford's horizontal skyline, but these vertical landmarks crumbled in the 1906 earthquake. Post-earthquake, Bakewell and Brown abandoned the original master plan that you can see on the top and started on a new quadrangular plan to the east that blocked the east-west progression. And there is a building. So you can see this building that starts interrupting the axes on the east-west. They, they have actually dramatically moved away from the original uh, master plan of a continuous east-west progression. So here you see that the Green Library is um, now the centerpiece uh, in this new master plan. And the Art Gallery is actually the corner piece um, of this new plan. Overall, the composition still continues to be horizontal and a continuous arcade connects all the buildings uh, like at the main quad. The thing to notice is that the plan envisioned a simple horizontal building at the site of the current tower that you see in the circle over there. 
Later developments of that same plan shows that the East Quadrangle continued to conceptualize Hoover Tower as a still interconnected and horizontal building. Though the, the library had expanded in size, they basically continued to draw it as a quadrangular plan. But by 1939, that is shown on the right, um, you can see a dramatic change. The continuous arcade concept was completely abandoned and both the new building, uh, the School of Education building, as well as Hoover Tower were designed as freestanding independent buildings. And the tower symbolically replaced the lost steeple of the church. The arcade at the main quad has a specific function. It connects all the buildings, maintains continuity, and enables the composition to read as an ensemble. By contrast, east of the main quad, the arcade is absent or discontinuous, and the buildings are independent of each other. Hoover Tower dominates the horizon, creating an asymmetrical counterpoint to the main quad. The tower acts as a beacon and interrupts Stanford's other very horizontal uh, skyline. So here you can see what would have been the original plan of a very horizontal design was completely interrupted by the vertical uh, you know, tower. So thank you for your attention. And I will hand over the platform to um, Eric. But everybody knows this, that during the uh, final um, Cal games, the tower gets beautifully lit in red. And be Cal. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Safna. That was excellent. That was excellent. So thanks. We've heard a bit about the uh, architect and about the architecture. I'd like to speak about how the tower fulfills what I consider to be its primary function as a vertical space for knowledge for the Hoover Institution and its library and archive. And, and by a vertical space for knowledge, I mean that the tower houses places to work, offices, labs, and so on, while also storing some of our most important library and archival collections on war, revolution, and peace. So you can think of the steel and concrete tower building as a container for knowledge. Literally, it was built as a library, of course. I was um, doing some reading in the architectural literature to prepare for my remarks, and I came across this, uh, this sentence, uh, which is a bit impenetrable. A tower translates verticality as an epistemological concept into architectural language. Let me, let me try to translate that sentence into English. Space on campus exists all around us. If you take a vertical chunk of that space, you surround it by steel and concrete, and you fill it with books, archives, scholars, and colleagues working on them, you, you, um, you're you surrounding knowledge in this bounded space. Thus, a tower for library and archive collections can never be just a building. It's always more than that. Now that I've sealed it in for you, imagine you take the wall off of this container and look at what's inside. What would you see from the foundation up? Well, below ground level, we have offices for scholars and staff and um, library and archives labs for preservation, digitization, and other functions. At the main entrance, as many of you know, there's a rotunda, two beautiful exhibit wings, offices, and a reading room. Now, the reading room, as you heard earlier, um, is not on the floor in which it was originally envisioned, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Above that, you have another floor of offices. Then in the middle is the meat of the tower, 17 short floors of stacks containing archival boxes and books, and then more offices and the observation deck and the carillon. So, so at its center, the tower holds some of our most precious human and archival capital. And that's what fills the epistemological container of the tower. The towers and ancient symbols, you know, going far back in history, Babel, Jericho, Babylon, it's an excellent symbol for a library. Uh, Montaigne wrote his essays while living in a tower containing his library. All of you remember working late in the library as a student, Montaigne actually lived, ate, and slept in his own personal tower library, um, something which, which we all wish we could do at the Hoover Library sometimes. Um, James Joyce, if you're a fan, spent only a few nights personally in the Martello Tower. But that was enough for him to begin Ulysses with Stephen, Stephen Dedalus in the tower, which, by the way, now houses a Joyce Museum. So it's not surprising that libraries are often built in the form of towers. And if you look around the world, you'll see this. Uh, the Book Tower at University of Ghent, the Sterling Library at Yale, Louvain Library and Tower, and what I like to call the horrifying act of violence that is the Bobst Library at New York University. 
a 12 story Philip Johnson tower that's hollow, hollow in the middle, yet supposed to serve as a library. But of course, the best one is the Hoover Tower. Um, just one, one word about Mr. Hoover. The institution and the library and archives came into being because of Herbert Hoover. In 1917, he gave a $50,000 donation, a million dollars in today's dollars with a telegram serving as his deed of gift. The telegram had few words, but the operative ones were to quote, collect historical materials on war. Even decades before this telegram though, in 1917, Mr. Hoover began donating books and money to people to collect books for the Stanford libraries, decades before he founded the institution. Um, Mr. Hoover was inspired to create this library by the work of a historian named Andrew White, who was the first president of Cornell and who personally collected materials on the French Revolution, donated it to Cornell. And so Hoover understood the value of the archival record and the importance of a good tower. So the tower was built in 1941, but, but what kind of collecting is going on before that? From our founding in 1917, until the tower was constructed, about 25 years of collecting went on around the world by Hoover staff, Stanford faculty, and others for the library and archives. Where were these collections before we had this wonderful epistemological space in which to store them? Well, they were distributed in various places in the Stanford library, some in dedicated rooms, some not, some across basements, some not. Uh, they were certainly not always kept, quote, as a separate collection, kept upon separate stacks, and with a separate room for their use, unquote, which is what Stanford President Ray Lyman Wilbur advised the trustees Mr. Hoover wanted. Uh, to be fair, it was not just poor management from the Stanford library directors that spread the collections across many basements. It was frankly, the pace of Hoover Library's collecting, which was driven by Mr. Hoover, who once famously said, there will be a thousand years to catalog this library, but only 10 years in which to acquire the most valuable material. As you might imagine, we're still collecting and still cataloging digitally. In any event, the completion of the tower allowed for the Hoover collections finally to be centralized for the first time in the institution's history, conveniently organized in this vertical dimension of a tower. Um, if you think about it now, metaphors of great knowledge in the pre-digital age are often about piles, a stack of papers, a mountain of material, a pyramid, a tower. Um, so when you look at the tower from the outside and you saw some excellent pictures, you can think about a library tower. It can reveal what's inside it or it can hide it. Um, looking from the outside of the Hoover Tower, the material inside is indeed hidden from outside viewers. But when you come inside, the collections are organized and ordered so they can be found and brought to researchers. Um, at the dedication of the tower, Mr. Hoover said, I suppose someone will wonder why all this trouble and expense to preserve these records. The purpose of this institution is to promote peace. Its records stand as a challenge to those who promote war. They should attract those who search for peace. I therefore dedicate this building to these purposes. You might ask, what records, what collections? At Hoover, we really do have the greatest collections on war, revolution, and peace, or social, economic, and political change, if you prefer, in the 20th and 21st centuries. Global in scope with curators overseeing geographic regions, Russia and Eurasia, Europe, China, Japan, Latin America, the United States, and also intellectually with collections on freedom, economics, political movements, and so on. Everyone who knows our collections in the tower and elsewhere has a favorite item. For Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who came to Hoover after leaving the Soviet Union and spent months in an office in the tower, it was the Russian newspapers he was denied access to under communism. For others, it might be the abdication letter of the czar or Frederick Hayek's personal manuscript of Road to Serfdom or Nim Wales' photographs of Chairman Mao in the Yunnan caves or letters by Frida Kahlo or Chiang Kai-shek's diary, General Stilwell's diary, the Polish government in exile records, the Bath Party archive, Juan Perón's letters. I could go on and on among the amazing 6,500 collections and almost 1 million books, much of which document the struggle for freedom from tyranny. But back to the tower. It is an interesting fact that it was originally designed to have its reading room on the top floor with researchers reaching the apex to consult the collections. This model fits the hierarchy of knowledge in some ways. Scholars ascending to sit atop a pile of hundreds of thousands of books and a mass of archives in the stacks beneath them. But the construction of the tower coincided with the beginning of World War II. 
of Belgian Carillon was stranded at the World's Fair in New York City with no way to go back. And Mr. Hoover ensured it would instead move to the top of the tower, which was redesigned with the reading room, moved to the first floor. So the model of hierarchy with the researcher on top and collections below is really flipped in our tower. Um, of course, in any tower, there are limits to the extension of knowledge upwards physically, not, not metaphorically. As we have continued to collect, the tower has filled up and we have need for more storage. Can you imagine asking Santa Clara County, perhaps the most regulated place on earth, for permission to build upwards? No. Instead, in the years since the tower opened, we built downwards underneath the Lou Henry Hoover and Herbert Hoover Memorial Buildings to preserve the collections. Regardless of whether the material is stored in a tower, a basement, or horizontal plane, or anywhere else, ultimately what matters is how to get the materials to researchers. Physically and technologically, that means trucks, carts, people. It means information systems, tracking, barcoding, and most importantly, it means access to digital copies of physical material. The hierarchy and ordering of the tower as a space for knowledge has been disrupted like everything else by technology. Several thousand people a year do come in in person to visit the reading rooms annually and look at the material, but tens of thousands see the material online digitally and never come to the tower to experience it, unfortunately, as we continue the efforts to create the future of a mass digitized library. Um, nonetheless, the tower has been a great success symbolically, practically, and in other ways. Let me leave you before questions with a quote from Mr. Hoover's dedication, and then we'll take the questions. I am convinced that we are establishing here a real important cultural center in the United States, that it will furnish a continuous source of research, not alone in history, but in social and economic forces, and as such is a distinct addition to the whole educational fabric of the country. I couldn't agree more. Thank you. I will ask our, our uh, fellow panelists, Sapna and Jeff, to join us visually, and I will uh, raise some of the questions that have come up, some of the excellent questions. Thank you for asking. First one, uh, Sapna, I think is, is for you. Hoover Tower is the highest building at Stanford today. Is there a height limit on campus? And if so, we would never have had the Hoover Building today. So, so what, was this height limit a mistake? There, there is no height limit per se on campus unless you know you're on closer to one of the public streets. But um, as you can see, you know, even prior to the the tower being there, there was the steeple of the church which was tall, and so was the. Uh, memorial arch that was completely tall. So the, the tower was just taking over symbolically the, the steeple of the church and being the new symbolic center or the counterpoint to the main quad. So yeah, I mean, the, it's completely valid to have a, how cool is that having a tall vertical library? <laughs> Knowledge. Thanks, Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, Jeff, next question is for you. In the matter of concrete for buildings, what influence, if any, did the columbarium as a poured concrete structure have for Brown or other architects? Well, um, really, Brown had been working in concrete since uh, really the beginning of the 20th century, but particularly after the earthquake in 1906. He, uh, for example, had done the Berkeley Town Hall in 1908. So he had been working in concrete uh, really for almost 30, well, about 30 years uh, before the planning of the library. So he knew the material very well. Also uh, recall that he was, you know, really familiar with the detailing of concrete uh, through some of the work at, at his training at uh, UC Berkeley. Sorry, I had to say it. And uh, so he'd been working with some of the professors of engineering there who were leaders in the uh, use of concrete, particularly Ernest Ransom, who developed the barbed reinforcing that we use today, um, kind of coterminously with Francois Ambique in Paris. So uh, for Brown, I don't think concrete had a metaphor historical resonance as much as a practical one. It was a plastic material that also would allow his engineers to create a as seismically sound a building as possible. And of course, at Hoover Tower, seismic considerations were 
quite important. Thanks, Jeff. Um, question is, what was going on at the tower before it officially opened in 1942? As a kid, I remember seeing Alexander Kerensky at the base of the tower in the late 1940s. I can say that uh, Kerensky did come to Hoover, uh, studied materials here, taught classes, um, and was a great presence in, in seminars there. But as far as what was going on in the tower before its official opening, I, I turn to our other um, colleagues to ask what, what, what was going on there. I, I'm not aware of anything particularly going on. I know that it was uh, planned and constructed pretty quickly, so. The construction was really done by January 1st, yeah. 1941. Uh, and it, it they turned the keys over to allow the archivist and the librarians to begin filling the building. Uh, at that point, only about uh, six floors of the stacks were constructed. Uh, that's all they needed at that point. And they added the stacks over the next 10 years or so as the collection grew with the crises in Europe of the 1940s. Thanks, thanks. Um, I've heard that a second Hoover Tower was planned for the opposite side of the quad, but the project wasn't carried through. Was Arthur Brown Jr. involved in this idea? There wasn't really a second um, tower planned. I know that there was a the quad was continued to meant to continue on either side, and now where the SEQ is, we have actually managed to continue the quad, but and you know, honor the original master plan. But there wasn't really another tower per se planned. Uh, memorial might have been what what you know this particular uh, person is asking about. Couple of good questions on earthquake resistance and construction to protect. Uh, how is earthquake resistant? Resistant is the Hoover Tower, and what kind of earthquake reinforcement happens in there? Again, I can answer this question. Um, the we have um, levels of earthquake protection, and in in the situ situation of an earthquake, the tower is designed so that it will um, withstand the earthquake with certain amount of damage. So the, the buildings are all kind of given different levels in terms of earthquake protectedness. Some of the um, buildings will have to close down, that is assumed, and certain amount of da damage is also assumed uh, in these buildings, but it is, it is already um, pretty earthquake. And as you know, it has been struck twice by lightning and it has been struck in the same exact spot twice by lightning and it has done really well. So we, we're not anticipating that it's not gonna do well. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Um, what's the architectural relationship, if any, between Hoover Tower and its architects and the Nebraska State Capitol in Lincoln? They're so similar, but have different architects, do they not? I, I can answer. It was Cram, I believe, who was the architect for Nebraska State Capitol. And it's true, they look very similar. And, you know, I went back and tried to look and see um, if they actually, you know, had a conversation or was one influenced by the other, but I couldn't find a link. So I'm assuming that, um, you know, they were both, uh, both Cram and uh, Bakewell and Brown, or particularly Arthur Brown, were both um, in conversation when they were going through the World's Fair. And so it's easy to you know, speculate that they were influenced by some of the things that they had had conversations during the World's Fair. Jeff, go ahead, yeah, please. Oh, I just was going to say, uh, you know, the Nebraska State Capitol uh, really uh, is a work of, you know, Bertram Goodhue had most of the, the share of the design work there and, and he passed away in 1924. So, uh, that that build that particular building uh, had to be carried on by uh, his successor, the firm of uh, you know I guess it was Ferguson at that point, uh, and uh, it was very unfortunate because the Nebraska State Capitol was very much a symbol of a new American modernism that uh, had a great deal of energy behind it, and uh, the impact of European modernism in the 1930s uh, with the movement of uh, Mies van der Rohe and Walter Gropius to the United States in 1937, there might have been a more um, 
receptive American form of modernism for larger structures. We had Frank Lloyd Wright, but most of Wright's buildings were very small, they're residential. They don't, that language doesn't translate to large public buildings as well as some of these others did. And the Nebraska State Capitol, it's just a beautiful building covered with uh, art absolutely everywhere. If you've been to the building, uh, one of my favorite things about it are the dinosaurs in the mosaics in the floor of the elf elevator lobby. They wanted to make sure that they covered all the flora and fauna of Nebraska, both contemporary and ancient. And there's nothing more fun than finding the stegosaurus and the triceratops and that kind of thing. Um, so um, it's, it's true that there is this discussion among Amer American architects, particularly traditionalists like Cram and Brown, as to how to move forward in the 1920s. Um, and, you know, the Nebraska State Capitol was one way to move forward, but unfortunately, uh, the uh, architect of that building just really wasn't with us to continue the, the conversation. We have a question about um, Herbert Hoover's vision of 100 years ago. Uh, do we think Hoover himself contemplated collecting only World War I and post-war era materials? Or is there some indication he intended collecting to press forward into other historic events into the future? I think it's, I'll answer if I can take this one. It's absolutely the case that he envisioned further collection, collecting beyond World War I and uh, the CRB and ARA records in where he was involved in pushing people to collect around the world. He spoke about this being a home for material on communism, fascism, pacifism, and other areas. And he definitely saw an expansive collecting vision that went into the future to teach people about peace. Uh, so I think that his vision definitely went on from there. Uh, I have a question about um, what drew you to study Arthur Brown and Stanford architecture respectively? Well, I, I've been asked that question several times today. Um, very simply, I'd been initially interested in the work of Willis Polk, the architect of Filoli and the Howardy building in San Francisco. Uh, but his papers were destroyed. They were stored in Sather Tower, ironically, and the birds got in there and the birds destroyed their papers and William Worcester threw them out in the 1960s. Uh, so I started looking around and Brown was in fact Willis Polk's successor. When Polk died, Brown had to clean up the mess left behind. And I started looking more at Arthur Brown and it turned out that my dissertation advisor had a four inch thick file on Bakewell and Brown, including the name and address of the Brown descendants. And that pretty much sealed it. Um, I'm from San Jose. Uh, I visited Stanford by the time I was six or seven. And uh, so I knew the work on the Stanford campus. Of course, I knew Coit Tower and San Francisco City Hall. And so uh, this was architecture that I had grown up with all my life. And uh, the Stanford campus made a big impression on me, uh, you know, in first and second grade. And so I've been coming back. Thanks. So Optima, you want to talk about uh, your, your, your approach to Stanford? My, my love for uh, Bakewell and Browns, by the way, I asked this question to Jeffrey today before, <laughs> so I set him up for this. But um, I, you know, I have worked on every one of these buildings uh, by Bakewell and Brown since the beginning of my career at Stanford and gotten to learn um, their architectural um, sophistication over time. And um, I have been just, you know, continually impressed by the, the uh, transition they go through, starting from the art gallery where they are so uh, influenced by the Richardsonian Romanesque architecture. And then, um, you know, despite all the adversity of the time, and I'm sure funding was limited, they were pretty creative and some of the most beautiful courtyards on campus are by uh, Bakewell and Brown uh, designs. And they were versatile starting from like, um, Old Union, where they were, there were two existing buildings already over there, and they were just adding on, but they made it all look like an ensemble that was created together. And despite the fact that they did not um, 
honor kind of the original Olmsted plan. The collection of buildings that they have created on campus are just very impressive in terms of their uh, sophistication and proportions. And as we always say that Hoover Tower, though it is very naked in terms of ornamentation, it is still so beautifully proportioned and the play of light and uh, shadow is so well done over there. Thanks. Um, I, I, we started a tiny bit later to take two more questions and then I wanna mention the raffle. W was there any controversy about the building of the tower so different from other buildings on campus, particularly as the arch and the church tower were gone? Well, I was just going to say, not really. Uh, people wanted to know what this thing was, uh, and they were surprised. And of course, in the time period, 1939, 1940, there was suspicion, is this some sort of military something or other? Particularly if you say, oh, it's the war library, which casually people used to call it. And you know, that got people probably a little nervous. The newspaper accounts uh, are very specific. There was a, a PR campaign to inform the public as to what the building was, what it was about, uh, because pe you, people couldn't help but see what was going on. You, you drive by on the El Camino and you would see this thing rising up out of the campus. They had questions. And so, but I don't think there was a great deal of controversy among the student body or among the faculty, uh, I think people were aware of the kind of vertical elements that most university campuses had and were quite conscious of the fact that Stanford had lost theirs. Now, there was a movement to rebuild the Memorial Arch, and that's something that uh, President uh, Wilbur really wanted to accomplish before the end of his term, and it didn't happen. But uh, there are letters establishing uh, that that was a goal of his, and Brown was asked to do detailed drawings and estimates for the reconstruction of the arch. And that would have accompanied the tower as symbols of the 50th year anniversary of the founding of the, of the university. Thanks, Jeff. I do wanna take a few more because they're actually some really interesting ones. Was there any communication between Julia Morgan and Brown? She was trained at Ecole de Beaux Arts, worked with Concrete, and was based in the Bay Area. Uh, very much so. Uh, I've delivered papers on this. The Morgans and the Browns were good friends. Mr. Morgan and Mr. Brown Sr. took the same ferry to San Francisco every day to go to work. Uh, and Mrs. Brown was Julia Morgan's chaperone in Paris when she had to go to the doctor, something like that, uh, needed a female accompany, somebody female accompanying her. It was Arthur Brown's mother who did this. So uh, the Browns and the Morgans were very close. In fact, Julia Morgan delayed her trip to Paris a year because Mrs. Brown got sick and couldn't go. Uh, and on what was supposed to be Arthur Brown's junior year abroad, which ended up being a six year trip a year later. Uh, Mrs. Brown accompanied them both to Paris. She was there for three and a half years with them because there's nothing quite like having mom go to grad school with you. Uh, so yes, they were very close and they kept in touch with each other throughout their lives. Thanks. I'll take the question. Uh, did Herbert Hoover have an office at the upper level of the tower? Yes, he did. He divided much of his later life between the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York and an office in the 14th floor of the tower, which we still have up there. It's, it's, a, it's a nice um, space. Um, someone want to take the question of uh, the observation uh, level had a simple railing from the 50s in the 50s, and uh, which offered a free and open view of the campus. When was it replaced and why? I can take that. Um, it was replaced, I think, in the 1960s. Actually, the current uh, railing is designed by Ernest Kump, who is the architect of the um, HHMB building. And um, I believe the, there were safety concerns and there might have been even a incident. So that is the reason that um, the, the rails were installed. 
Now, of course, you know, the, the big pranks that took place of going down the Hoover Tower side and putting the footsteps, that would have been a lot easier with, with the shorter railing, I'm sure. That's a great picture, Sue. <laughs> Can we do one more and then we're going to, we're going to stop and now just, are there any other buildings by Brown that use a carillon or bells and are they similar to the tower? Uh, yes, the Tower of the Sun, in fact, had a carillon in it uh, for the GGIE, the Golden Gate International Exposition, the Treasure Island Fair, and those bells were installed in Grace Cathedral up on Knob Hill in San Francisco. I think our clairons were, they, they came from a, um, one of the exposition buildings, correct? The Belgian Pavilion. Yes. Of the New York World's Fair. San Francisco was particularly unlock, unlucky with its World's Fairs. 1915 and 1939 were not good years <laughs> to have a World's Fair celebrating peace and harmony among the nations. It's, it's, and good thing we have the tower to celebrate peace. Um, I'm going to uh, stop the questions there. Let me, let me, I, I want to mention the raffle, but first I want to thank Sop and Jeff for their excellent, excellent help here. Thank you so much for uh, being here and speaking. Thank you so much.